Verse 9, But now, after that ye have known God. Is it not amazing, cries Paul, that you Galatians who knew God intimately by the hearing of the gospel should all of a sudden revert from the true knowledge of his will, in which I thought you were confirmed, to the weak and beggarly elements of the law, which can only enslave you again? Verse 9, Or rather are known of God. The apostle turns the foregoing sentence around. He fears the Galatians have lost God altogether. Alas, he cries, have you come to this, that you no longer know God? What else am I to think? Nevertheless, God knows you. Our knowledge of God is rather passive than active. God knows us better than we know God. Ye are known of God means that God brings his gospel to our attention and endows us with faith and the Holy Spirit. Even in these words, the apostle denies the possibility of our knowing God by the performance of the law. No man knoweth who the Father is, but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Luke 10.22 By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Isaiah 53.11 The apostle frankly expresses his surprise to the Galatians that they who had known God intimately through the gospel should so easily be persuaded by the false apostles to return to the weak and beggarly elements of the law. I would not be surprised to see my church perverted by some fanatic through one or two sermons. We are no better than the apostles who had to witness the subversion of the churches which they had planted with their own hands. Nevertheless, Christ will reign to the end of the world, and that miraculously, as he did during the Dark Ages. Paul seems to think rather ill of the law. He calls it the elements of the world, the weak and beggarly elements of the world. Was it not irreverent for him to speak that way about the holy law of God? The law ought to prepare the way of Christ into the hearts of men. That is the true purpose and function of the law. But if the law presumes to usurp the place and function of the gospel, it is no longer the holy law of God, but a pseudo-gospel. If you care to amplify this matter, you may add the observation that the law is a weak and beggarly element because it makes people weak and beggarly. The law has no power and affluence to make men strong and rich before God. To seek to be justified by the law amounts to the same thing as if a person who is already weak and feeble should try to find strength and weakness, or as if a person with the dropsy should seek a cure by exposing himself to the pestilence or as if a leper should go to a leper and a beggar to a beggar to find health and wealth. Those who seek to be justified by the law grow weaker and more destitute right along. They are weak and bankrupt to begin with. They are by nature the children of wrath. Yet for salvation, they grasp at the straw of the law. The law can only aggravate their weakness and poverty. The law makes them ten times weaker and poorer than they were before. I and many others have experienced the truth of this. I have known monks who zealously labored to please God for salvation, but the more they labored, the more impatient, miserable, uncertain, and fearful they became. What else can you expect? You cannot grow strong through weakness and rich through poverty. People who prefer the law to the gospel are like Aesop's dog who let go of the meat to snatch at the shadow of the water. There is no satisfaction in the law. What satisfaction can there be in collecting laws with which to torment oneself and others? One law breeds ten more until their number is legion. Who would have thought it possible that the Galatians, taught as they were by the efficient apostle and teacher Paul, could so quickly be led astray by the false apostles? To fall away from the gospel is an easy matter because few people appreciate what an excellent treasure the knowledge of Christ really is. People are not sufficiently exercised in their faith by afflictions. They do not wrestle against sin. They live in security without conflict. Because they have never been tried in the furnace of affliction, they are not properly equipped with the armor of God and know not how to use the sword of the Spirit. As long as they are being shepherded by faithful pastors, all is well. But when their faithful shepherds are gone, and wolves disguised as sheep break into the fold, back they go to the weak and beggarly elements of the law. Whoever goes back to the law loses the knowledge of the truth, 
fails in the recognition of his sinfulness, does not know God, nor the devil, nor himself, and does not understand the meaning and purpose of the law. Without the knowledge of Christ, a man will always argue that the law is necessary for salvation, that it will strengthen the weak and enrich the poor. Wherever this opinion holds sway, the promises of God are denied, Christ is demoted, hypocrisy and idolatry are established. Verse 9, Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? The apostle pointedly asks the Galatians whether they desire to be in bondage again to the law. The law is weak and poor. The sinner is weak and poor. Two feeble beggars trying to help each other, they cannot do it. They only wear each other out. But through Christ, a weak and poor sinner is revived and enriched unto eternal life. Verse 10, Ye observe days and months and times and years. The Apostle Paul knew what the false apostles were teaching the Galatians, the observance of days and months and times and years. The Jews had been obliged to keep holy the Sabbath day, the new moons, the feast of the Passover, the feast of tabernacles, and other feasts. The false apostles constrained the Galatians to observe these Jewish feasts under the threat of damnation. Paul hastens to tell the Galatians that they were exchanging their Christian liberty for the weak and beggarly elements of the world. Verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. It grieves the apostle to think that he might have preached the gospel to the Galatians in vain. But this statement expresses more than grief. Behind his apparent disappointment at their failure lurks the sharp reprimand that they have forsaken Christ and that they were proving themselves to be obstinate unbelievers. But he does not openly condemn them for fear that over-sharp criticism might alienate them altogether. He therefore changes the tone of his voice and speaks kindly to them.